So we will move towards, let's get rid of the weather clothing and everything else to do with renewables and get back to a sturdier form of power, nuclear power. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm once again grateful to Bournemouth Natural Science Society for allowing me to trial my first version of yet another simpler talk on nuclear energy to stave off global warming. It's a story of invention, discovery, obstacles, dead ends, daring escapes, and facing the implacable forces of Bumbledon. The state of play is followed by our Twitter site on, on nuclear, which has a, a repository of key articles. The big problems are radiation, nuclear waste, and safety. I will illustrate the story with some of the things we are trying to save. Fruits and vegetables. The Victorians knew about electrons. Um, in 1920, Rutherford identified the proton as the nucleus of the hydrogen atom. And there we have a hydrogen atom. In uh, 1934, oh, if we add a neutron to this, and the neutron, an uncharged companion to the proton, uh, added to hydrogen, and we get deuterium, or heavy hydrogen. And so, Neutrons, which I model with a little piece of cauliflower here, magically build or transform nuclei and can smash atoms. And there are thousands of spells in the big book of spells about neutrons and what they do in matter, uh, which enable the neutron to operate its power. In 1938, Otto Hahn and uh, Lisa Meitner discovered the fission of uranium and the energy released. Look at the simplicity of their laboratory, reconstructed for a museum. Every scientist who knew this mighty new energy source also knew that a devastating weapon would be possible. Wartime politicians leapt on this, created the Manhattan Project and all the technologies. The first atom bomb was exploded in 1945, only seven years later. Terror, of all things, nuclear was born and is relentlessly fostered by politicians today. My model of uranium-238 is a cauliflower with eight of its protons standing forth there. It's a nice model because you can see it from the back of the hall and it's easier to build than a stick and ball model. There is a second isotope of uranium that occurs naturally, and that is uranium-235. And the property of this one, which is the key nuclear fuel, is that if I drop a cool neutron into this, I get a fission of the nucleus and a destruction of the atom and a mighty explosion. This is a big event for an atom and an amazing number of things happen. And initially it fires out a whole array of alpha particles, spray of neutrons, electrons and very powerful gamma rays which are more penetrating than x-rays. The alphas are easily stopped just by a sheet of paper placed over them. And so they can be stopped like that. The electrons, a piece of kitchen foil, will stop the beta particles from approaching you. Just don't eat any of those things, or, or the radiation, this radiation, will stop in your flesh instead of in a piece of paper. The bulk of the nucleus is split into two parts, into lighter elements. 
Technetium, Technetium 99 is very faintly radioactive. It uh, has a very long lifetime and can be used. It's not nuclear waste. It can be used in industrial alloys and, and metals. Another element would be a uh, radioactive element would be iodine-131. Now, iodine-131 decays in eight hours into um, uh, xenon and floats away as a, as a noble gas. And so it, it decays so rapidly that there is now no longer any radioactive iodine at all following the Fukushima fiasco. These products, the rest of them, there are a total of about 30, these products will decay into rare earths. And here I've got something recently out of the earth. And precious metals, like silver 109. And when you add up in 50 years' time the value of all of the isotopes that are now stable and usable, they're worth 20 million pounds a ton. So, waste is not useless. I brought a few samples of radioactive materials to show you. This banana has a small amount of potassium-40 in it. It has a very long lifetime, and it will give you a very tiny dose of radiation from which your body easily recovers and repairs any damage it might have made. So there you are, a radioactive banana. At the other end of the scale, I brought in a piece of real high-end nuclear waste. And this is a fire and smoke alarm powered by a little tiny speck of americium 241. This has saved thousands of lives and thousands of properties, and you can buy it anywhere in, in the USA. Well, that sounds all very comforting, but at some point in time, radiation is dangerous. And so, when is it significant? Well, the doses are measured in sieverts, or watts delivered to the body. Up to 100 millisieverts is regarded as a safe maximum annual exposure. Radiation sickness, kicks in above one watt. This is one million, million, million gamma rays at one MeV. These are like tiny needles passing straight through your body, but each one can break up at hundreds of molecules as it goes. It's like a train wreck in your body. But those victims can be treated under one watt. Above two watts, nobody survives. So we understand radiation very well, we understand the limits and what to do about it. So let's get back to reactors. And here is the uh, lights, please. Here is the uh, Arriva EPR reactor, which has um, four different uh, cooling circuits and it has a wonderful uh, double concrete dome around it so that in the event of any mishap, Nothing will escape from that dome. So if there is a meltdown of this reactor, which is very faintly possible after all of these things have been done, then nothing will escape from that dome, but the company will lose a very expensive reactor. Arriva uses solid fuel rods, enriched to 5%. This is 50 cauliflowers in a 1,000 leaving a heap of 10,000 cauliflowers, lights please, 10,000 cauliflowers, sorry, uh, atoms, with only 0.2% of 235. This is called depleted uranium. And the depleted uranium is now the largest standing energy source on the planet anywhere. In a talk at MIT in 2007, I showed that the UK owns enough DU to fuel an electric Britain for 500 years. Department of Energy now uses the number, but they're on a loss, at a loss as to how to do it. And here is how. 
with the neutron wand, I drop a cool neutron into U238. And that transmutes it into a different element, plutonium. And this element is just as good of a reactor fuel as U235. It's clearly complete bumbledom to bury spent fuel or depleted uranium just because some of it is slightly radioactive. But this is the UK plan A. There is no plan B. And it all leads to a dead end for nuclear power this century. With only 20 million tons of known or suspected uranium ore on the planet, there is only 140,000 tons of U235. School arithmetic shows that without recycling, the entire world's <coughs> supply of uranium would be used up by the end of the century by 2,000 reactors. Still, there are 4 billion tons of uranium in seawater at 3 grams a ton, but there's no plausible way to extract 2 million tons of uranium a year out of seawater. The spent fuel can be moved in five years after being taken out of the reactor to dry storage casks. And, and there should be no cooling ponds standing around for half a century the way the Americans have, have got it. The fast reactor, the S-PRISM here, is able to, it, it has an enrichment of 20%. It allows them to replace 105% of their 235 with plutonium fuel. With this level of breathing and recycling, the total 20 million tons of uranium could last over 2,000 years with 10,000 reactors. Well, that sounds not bad. 2,000 years is pretty good. Is there a better way that ticks more boxes? We're now going to move to a new element. Thorium 232. And thorium 232, lights please, is the, is the ultimate green fuel. It's all tightly wrapped up and its decay time, it is radioactive, is almost the length of time of the age of the, of the universe. So it's only very faintly radioactive. There's a brilliant walk-away safe reactor design conceived by Al Weinberg in the 1960s. And let's go to the diagram on the screen. The project was actually closed in favour of the um, PWR for generating power. So let me take you through this. It uses a liquid salt to dissolve the thorium in. Um, with thorium sitting here and neutrons coming into that liquid salt, it creates the uh, new element, uranium-233. And 233 is a reactor fuel. And so thorium is a way of making your own uranium. What's marvellous is that as you pump it around, you take it through uh, a, a chamber on, on, this, uh, on this loop, and you can separate out the uranium-233 just by bubbling fluorine gas through the liquid, and out comes the uranium, which you then put into the, uh, the fission loop, the reactor loop, and that can be recirculated. And as you recirculate it, more bubbling of gases and fluorine actually pulls out a lot of the fission product wastes. So you end up with a very, uh, uh, an almost waste-free reactor running uh, for you. And so, with the salt being liquid, it, uh, 850 degrees, it's got the viscosity and density of water. If anything goes wrong with a pump, then you simply 
open the cocks and disperse the fluids to holding tanks, you repair the, the pumps and you uh, restart the reactor. No loss of the reactor, no problems at all. So marvellous, a walk-away safe reactor to displace all the water-cooled PWRs as they are decommissioned. Well, this alone is sufficient to give thorium the prize of a gold medal for thorium. So there we go. There's one huge obstacle to such great result. Bumblers can delay the development of anything by 10 or 20 years. No matter how smart the scientists are, they could trash the planet anyway. Private funding like the frackers is the best way around them. These reactors have to be served, of course, by robots because of the gamma rays being emitted by this particular device. So nuclear power. We've got radiation control. We understand what we're doing. We've got to do re reprocessing. We've got fabulous walk-away safe reactors. And the total resource of uranium and thorium gives us 10,000 years at, at um, 10,000 uh, reactors or more. And so that is the story for nuclear power. It still leaves the question open as to whether this will all really work this century. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Bournemouth Natural Science heard the first version of, a t of my talk on fission and fusion which led to a minerals.